Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Cohn Resnick, Accounting Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. And by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Just listening to Paula Boggs, singer songwriter. There's a lot more than that. Uh, what was the song we we're listening to? It was the uh, the title song of our new album, Paula Boggs Band's new album, Carnival of Miracles. It was Carnival of Miracles. Um, That's it. Yeah. Carnival of Miracles. What does it mean? You know, Steve, life has its ups and downs, and. I'm not immune to that. I've had the highs of the highs and the lows of the lows, and that's, that's life. And so given where I am in, in life as, as a boomer, I couldn't think of a better metaphor mm. uh, than, than Carnival of Miracles. You've had one of the most fascinating careers. Mm. And I've been doing this for just a few years, and I've had some fascinating people sit in that seat. I was sitting there going, she's an army brat. Yes. Um, veteran, paratrooper. Um, and she goes on, she becomes one of the, the top lawyer for Starbucks. And she reports directly to chairman and CEO of Starbucks, Starbucks Howard Schultz. And after an extraordinary career there of about 10 years, yes. you decide, hey, Hey, I'm at the top of my game. I think I want to do something else. Yes. I need to do something else. I need to. Need to? Not need want to. to? Need to. What was it? Th 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 yeah. Create music? Yeah, well, you know, the, the bigger need was uh, what I call being CEO of my life. And what I, what I mean by that is starting a chapter, and, and I'm in this chapter, of doing work that feeds my soul. And so, you know, after, after 30 years of, of law and, and business and a military career, as you referenced. By the way, go back. Military career was working with the White House. Yes. Working at the Pentagon. Yes. So. Jumping out of planes. Yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah jumping out of planes. So, I mean, you've done it at the highest level at everything you have done. S oh, well, who's that guy? You have a picture right there? Ah, the, the current president. <laughs> the commander in chief. The commander in chief. So, so here's my point. President Obama. So how is it that these other things that you've done at the top of your game, that they are not your true north? 
You know, I'm a very mission-driven person, Steve. And if you if you look at the you know, variety of things I've I've done in my life, the the seed that that ties most of them together is, you know, I've got to be doing something that that matters not just to me, but hopefully to other people, to society. So, you know, whether it was being you know, an army officer, or I was a federal prosecutor uh, for for five years, or you know, working for a company like like Starbucks, which you know it doesn't get it right all the time, but it really aspires to do the right thing every time mm. as as a corporate citizen. Um, you know, those are, you know, mission-driven values that speak to me deeply. In this chapter, though, I really wanted to be, you know, purely entrepreneurial about it. Uh, and, and so for me, that meant putting together uh, a, a system of things that um, spoke to me deeply. Uh, but could also hopefully make a difference in my community and society. And so the thing with music for me is, um, is such an amazing vehicle for all of that because I, I have to play. There's a, there's a, there's a physical uh, compulsion uh, that drives me to write music and perform it. Uh, we, we say that our music is, is music that, that matters, hopefully. Mm. And, you know, whether it's, you know, Carnival of Miracles. You write about Sandy Hook. I do. The this, horrific yes. incident of Sandy Hook. I do. Why? Um, I, was, um, I was incredibly moved by uh, the, the Sandy Hook story on on many levels. Uh, I, was, I was moved because later in life I became uh, a parent myself and I was on that path uh, to becoming uh, a parent, the legal guardian of my now 12 year old mm -hmm. niece. Um, even uh, at the time of Sandy Hook, she was um, a being very important uh, to me. Uh, but um, the Sandy Hook tragedy also happened at a time when there was a lot of conversation in the media around the end of the world. Uh, and so it that was the really... the end of the world was coming. That the end of the world was coming. And so it really was the combination of... Of, of the Newtown tragedy coupled with this conversation that led me to, to write uh, Carnival of, of Miracles. But you know what's interesting, as you talk about the lyrics are one thing. Yeah. The powerful nature of those miracles, talking about uh, current events is such a uh, cliche way to describe it. Things that are going on in the world that matter in our lives. But your musical influences Artists in Ella Fitzgerald, yeah. Bill Withers, yes, Neil Young. Yes. It was the Neil Young that threw me off. There was a pattern that I saw here, <laughs> and then I saw Neil Young. Very eclectic, and soul grass is how you describe your music. Please yes. explain. Yes. So you could have just said R and B, but it's not. It really is. Because I'm listening, I'm going, that's not. It's, it's not elephant, but there are influences from all over. What? Well, explain. Yes, uh, Leonard Cohen is another Leonard Cohen. <laughs> influence. And, You're you going know, all the way back to the 1960s folk, right? The yes, whole? absolutely. And I think maybe You're a step one, away from James Taylor. Go ahead. Yes, one way perhaps to you know, make sense of it is, you know, my, my dad was Roman Catholic and my mom was African Methodist Episcopal. So, you know, every other week I'd, I'd be, AME. you know, AME and every other week I'd be <laughs> Roman Catholic. And so this was, you know, at a time when, you know, folk music and the folk mass was 
coming of age. I, I was in Catholic school, uh, you know, and you know the nuns were singing uh, and playing Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Simon and Garfunkel and and whatnot. That folk so, thing got you. Yeah, oh yeah, the the folk thing got me, but also the gospel thing got me. Mm. Uh, and so Mahalia when Jackson. you Yes, Mahalia Jackson, you know, so you the staple to, the staple singers. So all of that's going on for you. All of that is is going on for me. And you know, and then, you know, my mom did something, you know, really wacky when I was thirteen. She uh, she took us out of the segregated South and we moved to Europe. Uh, and so, you know, at age 13, I started getting exposed to, you know, classical music and, you know, jazz and other forms of music that really hadn't been part of my background up to that point. And so, you know, all of that comes together. And when you say Neil Young, uh, you know, Heart of Gold was, oh uh, you know, one of the first records. I got to buy myself. So, uh, and it might have been 1971. Oh my absolutely. god! Absolutely. Oh and my god! Yeah, there you go. So there, there you Stop have it. Date. Okay. Um, <laughs> by the way, real quick before I let you out of here, could we show some video of a carnival of miracles being made? Uh, how long a period did it take for you to do this? It actually took a couple years to make this record. A couple it, years. A couple years. We recorded it in or a version of it in 2013 and then we re-recorded many parts of it in 2014. The uh, album is yeah. called Carnival of Miracles and Paula Boggs. Um, listen, I'm glad for everything you did at Starbucks because it's still my favorite place to go in the morning. No, no, no plug or commercial. <laughs> but I'm even happier that you are following what you have to do as an artist but more importantly as a person. And we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Stay with us. We're right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at steveadubato. Hi, Steve Adubato. I'm uh, pleased to be here with Warren Geller, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. And uh, we are on the rooftop, not for any particular reason other than the fact that we are standing across from an extraordinary facility that we're about to go in and take a look at. Talk about that facility. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And thanks for coming to Englewood Hospital today. This is our brand new state-of-the-art comprehensive 180,000 square foot cancer treatment and wellness center that we're delivering to our community. Describe it. What is it and why is it different than any other quote-unquote cancer center? It's everything from radiation oncology, infusion therapy, operating suites, to your super specialists all in one location. So you could have your visit, you could have your pre-treatment, your actual treatments and then your follow-up treatment all right here in this beautiful building behind me. Before we go in, we're uh, shooting actually in May of 2015. This is going to officially open in 2016. But as we speak, you were just telling me, Warren, before we uh, start the interview, that people are being treated right now, even though the completion doesn't happen with the entire building for several more months. How is that happening? My guys were very creative in that they flipped this project upside down on its head so that we could deliver the services 18 months before anticipated. So our radiation oncology unit is already opened, infusion therapy, we're currently treating 900 treatments a month, and we actually just had to order about two and a half years sooner than we anticipated our second radiation oncology machine because people are staying home for their treatments. Ready to go inside and take a look? Absolutely. Let's do it. Warren, now we are inside, in fact, the Cancer Treatment and Wellness Center at uh, Englewood. Talk to me about the fact that we're just telling me off camera that there's been an 80% increase in the demand for outpatient cancer service yes. and treatment. We, yes. We, we spent years crunching the numbers and doing this plan. started way back in 2010. And if you look at what's happening in Bergen and Hudson counties, we're not growing but we're aging more rapidly than other parts of the country. 
And as you age, 65 and over compared to 65 and under, you have a 10 times greater chance of fighting one form of cancer, never mind multiple forms as you're treated throughout your lifetime. And you know, you talk about multiple forms, and the other thing that's interesting about um, this cancer center is that you're really going after high profile physicians, oncologists, in a multidisciplinary approach. Why is that relevant? It, it's extremely relevant because it, it's really about the doctors and making the doctors available so people don't have to travel for their consultations and then their subsequent treatments. Whereas if you could recruit all of the experts, and thankfully we've had eight years in a row of an operating surplus from our main operations. So that's your, you could buy the technology to latest and greatest, but now you need to do it in a special environment. Mm. And how do you do that? And you saw some of that outside on what we're trying to accomplish. You know, we talk about the fact that <clears throat> it's interesting, Englewood is located in, in obviously uh, very close to the George Washington Bridge and we were upstairs and we we're up on the, uh, the rooftop you were saying, right over there, by the bridge, New York. That whole issue of people having the option of going over the bridge, across the bridge, or staying here, that's changed for people in many ways. All of these physicians, these experts, they trained in the same places, and they've chosen a different lifestyle where it's okay to practice in the suburbs. And again, keep people right here, because if you need 28 treatments of radiation therapy, part of your wellness is gonna be, how easy is it on your friends and family when they're bringing you for those treatments? Mm. That, that's not always easy. You know, we're in this extraordinary facility, um, and what Warren was telling us uh, just a few minutes ago, as you're watching, is that even though this is being built as we speak, people are being treated as we speak. Talk just a little bit about the kinds of treatment that people will experience in this center that heretofore hadn't happened before, specifically? Yeah, specifically, if you think of radiation oncology, over the years, typically, in healthcare facilities, they were put in the basement, and we would make up fancy words for it. We'd call it the lower level. But the reality was it was down, around a corner. There wasn't any natural light. It wasn't a great place to be cared for, no matter what the technology and the expert's availability was. But now, in less than 100 yards, after making a left turn off of the street here, you meet the same valet, the same concierge, the same therapist, the same nurse, and the same physician for every single treatment. It's very easy on people. Mm. And set up, we're about to talk to uh, your colleague who you brought in here to, to run the operation. And uh, before our folks meet him, tell everyone who he is and why he matters. Yeah, Dr. Stephen Brower is being brought in to be our medical director at the Cancer Treatment and Wellness Center. He's a expert, major oncologic surgeon who spent the last 25 plus years practicing at New York City and some other very prestigious institutions of caring for people, but maybe even more importantly, embracing the physician community, embracing those around him, collaborating because we're in this collaborative era of healthcare, because it's not one person in that treatment. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Thanks, Warren. You're welcome. Always good to see you, Steve. Warren talked about this gentleman right here. He's Dr. Stephen Brower, who is the medical director here at the Cancer Center and also the uh, chief of surgical oncology at Englewood. Let me ask you this, doctor. The exam rooms that we're seeing all around sure. us here at the Cancer Center, describe what's gonna go on here and, and why it's important and special to the patients who will be treated here. So, you know, the odyssey of a patient going through cancer is pretty complex. So we've got to pull together experts, confident, top of their game, who can ensure that the outcome is going to be right for each and every patient. But in addition to that, we have to marry that with understanding that there's a human being mm -hmm. around that treatment and there's a family and that the minute I give a patient the diagnosis, well, you have cancer, that can turn a life upside down and a family upside down. So we've got to be humanistic in all of this. And one of the things that I am most proud of 
is how this cancer center and this medical center has committed to that. So what does that mean in the rooms? That yeah. means that I can't just tell a patient, okay, you're gonna need surgery, or you may need radiation therapy, or chemotherapy. I need to understand what that means over the course of the time they're in the hospital getting surgery, the time they're recovering at home, how we're gonna support them. So in each of these rooms, there are gonna be specialists in nutrition, in wellness in general, in treating all of the other pieces of their physiology that will impact on a great outcome. That's cancer treatment? That's cancer treatment. Treating their diabetes, treating their heart disease, treating their uh, uh, nutritional status, vitamins, it all impacts, and it impacts on what we call the host, which is you and me, mm -hmm. and how we take care of our cancer. So The aesthetics matter too, because I've been struck by what it looks like physically. Well, you're not kidding. And in fact, there have even been scientific studies in some of our better uh, journals that say this kind of environment, the beauty of this environment, the serenity of it, the privacy of it, uh, leads to better outcomes. Why? It's better being involved in, 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 in this kind of facility with the support expertise than having just someone looking out on a parking lot or you know, being in a room where it's enclosed, where mm. there's anxiety and fear. And um, whether it's music therapy or art therapy or pet therapy or nutritional support, hey, I'm a surgeon. I'm a, I'm a you know, get in there and do it and do it right. But I know that these other pieces are just as important for my patients. Doctor, talk to us about the, um, the connection, if you will, between the technology and the clinicians. How much does that matter? Okay, Steve, so we spoke a little bit about expertise, and we have to have the physicians who are trained at the top cancer institutes that will be treating here. We have that. We've also got to recognize that cancer centers' main missions are to identifying healthcare disparities, on ensuring that the quality outcomes are at the top, ensuring that we understand national quality metrics and that we are comparable to any uh, 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 metric, that we can gather data and information from our electronic records and look at our outcomes, and also marry this with the incredible technology as you bring up in cancer. So whether it's understanding gene therapy and, and, and genetics in terms of how that influences our patients with breast and colorectal cancer and, and lung cancer, or whether it's me, surgeons doing minimally invasive cancer, protecting the normal organs, and, and, or it's a medical oncologist diminishing their toxicity, because our patients are being cured of cancer now. They're surviving. We need to ensure that their survivorship is, 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 is great. And so this is also what our cancer center is dedicated to. All of this technology uh, from gene therapy to targeting treatment and how we're gonna deliver that, we can do it all in one, in, in one building here. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're here with Dominique Lee, who is our $50,000 uh, winner of the Raspberry Awardee for Making a Difference. What did that feel like? Um, very humble in so many different ways. It felt very interesting, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Talk about the difference you're making every day in Newark with those school children. So it's a team of us that are really trying to do what is necessary for our, give children an opportunity to be successful in life. Um, so giving them a hope, you know, that's the first thing, restoring hope, um, giving them the tools to have a success in their careers and their education. Um, so it's a whole process. <laughs> and the biggest difference you're making in terms of how you've been creative to do that with your colleagues at Teach for America. So we work with existing partners and we try to change public policy. So it's one thing to attack the issue within your classroom. It's one thing to do it at the school level, but we're now trying to do it as a system-wide process um, that will affect all children across Newark. So to basically take the learnings that we have learned at the school level and taking that to the public policy realm. One more quick question. 
Um, what would you say to all those who are winners with you today and the folks at the Rustberry Foundation? I say let's stay, stay humble to your mission. Believe in what you do. Um, there will be hills and valleys that you have to go through, but always remember at the heart of what you're doing is the people that you serve. You know, a servant's mentality is the best way to live your life, in my opinion. Congratulations. Thank you. Dominic, let me ask you this. The organization you created called BRIC, what does it stand for? Um, building Responsible, Intelligent, Creative Kids. Where'd you come up with that name? Uh, we were actually in the Ironbound in Newark, and there was a brick wall, and we said, let's call ourselves after the city, Brick City, and developed the acronym. <laughs> and, and the test scores in Newark, these were kids at what grade, reading at what grade? No problem. So the schools that we, Avon, our first school that we assumed control over, was the lowest performing school in Newark and actually the second in the state. So you're talking about single digits in many of the grades of passing the state exam. You said we took it over. Tell folks who say understand who we really are. Yeah, so we, Dr. Janey at the time was the superintendent, and he gave us the ability, it was six of us, Teach for America alumni. That of the school. Of the school. Um, teach for, six Teach for America alumni came together, um, asked Dr. Janey to basically do a turnaround effort at Avon Avenue School, and that's BRIC, the organization. Wasn't that scary? It was scary, and it was a little naive of us <laughs> uh, to try to have the audacity of hope to think that we can actually do something different, and we have, right? What kind of things did you really do to turn it around? No problem. So one, we put hope back into the school. That's primary example. Um, quality teaching, um, making sure that the right teachers are in the right classrooms, um, meeting the needs of the students academically and social and emotional. Um, and those are two different needs, right? Because you have your academic needs, and then you have your social and emotional needs, because many of our children live in an environment where toxic stress um, is a daily occurrence, right? So we we as a school have to address the toxic stress that they're coming from every day. A lot of these children are facing violence, drugs, uh, lots of danger on the streets, and, and their home life, tough. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, in our neighborhood, 50% of our kids live on less than $10,000 coming into the household every single day. Um, on say how much? $10,000 every what? Every year. That's every year? Yeah, $10,000 every year. Um, 70 percent of our kids are in a single female head household. Um, about two thirds of our kids are in poverty. Um, so a whole host of issues that children basically confront every day, which leads to this whole notion of toxic stress. You know, it creates all types of issues around their um, health, um, their academic ability. Um, home life sometimes is not the best situation. So it's our responsibility to look at school not in an old traditional mindset, but how does the school basically wrap all these services necessary for the child to be successful. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, New Jersey Natural Gas, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, Cohn Resnick, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.